If you got a 401k and you don't know what to do with it, take a loan. Like, why would you keep your money in the 401k when it's going down, down, and down? Like, take the loan, pay off the debts, take the money, send it back over there. You're gonna make that money go to work for you. All we did is everything that you can already do. This is not a forever portfolio. This is a today portfolio that gets you through what could be a pretty rough period of time. When we lose principle, the whole game changes. What's going on everybody? Another week, another wealth webinar coming at you with a very hoarse voice, but we're going to push through because that's what we do. You got to be consistent and persistent and just do what other people are unwilling to do. Most people would be home sitting there or sleeping, trying to get better. And here we are, or here I am. You know, we just, we show up no matter what, no matter whether you're sick, got pneumonia, you got to just show up to the game. And that's what we're doing today. But it's a lot like that, where you got to show up for your family to protect your family against what's about to happen. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the markets. I, I want to focus today's webinar heavily on what we're going to call preservation of principle. It's vitally important. It's so vitally important today. And it's, it, it's going to be covered and going to be the major topic of next week's Money School Essentials three-day training that we're doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I just lined up an unbelievable speaker, a kind of a pinch hitter for Friday's session. Friday, we, we usually spend Friday doing a lot of really unique stuff, okay? I usually create it the night before, and then it's not going to be any different this time. But I got a speaker coming on who's going to be talking about the future future. What do I talk about that? Well, talking about blockchain. You know, a lot of people, almost on a daily basis, I would say, Stephen, people ask us, you know, what happens if the dollar, you know, loses value? What happens if the dollar goes to zero? What about digital currency? Well, we all know the Fed is pushing toward a digital currency. I mean, I think you can see the writing on the wall. Fed now was kind of the first stage of that. <clears throat> I think in the future, when they're done, you know, playing dual proxy war uh, or whatever they're doing. Uh, when that's all done, I think you'll start hearing about the digital dollar. It's just not the flavor of the week today. Uh, the dude is uh, on to something else. And I'm going to start saying the word dude a lot. And you guys can all figure out who the dude is because I can't use his name anymore. TikTok shut me down because I use the dude's name. But the dude, just so you can all be clear about who the dude is, is the guy that just let the names in, in the faces of our Delta Force out so that our enemies know who our most elite fighters are in this country, our, our most elite warriors, I guess I would call them. And now, whoops, the dude slipped up. Anyone know who the dude is? If you do, you can put it in the chat. But we're not gonna talk about the dude because we can't control what the dude says. Dude can't even control what the dude says or can't even control walking up the stairs. But we are gonna talk about things you can control. And you can control all the things surrounding <clears throat> your money and your portfolio. Blockchain may or may not be a piece of your portfolio today, but it will be in the future, whether you like it or not. Digital currency may or may not be a piece of what you do today, but it will be in the future. And I'm not talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all that. Matter of fact, uh, just because a lot of people like this, uh, you know, I did just last night, and I don't know if anyone else has been following it, but Bitcoin and Ethereum are on a tear. Steven, did you see that? Bitcoin hit 30, I don't know where it's at today, but it hit 34,000 last night. I went, whoa, that's a great exit. So I sold, sold all of them. And a lot of people are like, oh, you sold too early. Well, I think not, but you know, that, that is what it is. The blockchain stuff and how it applies to IBC is something that we're going to talk about with this pinch hitter speaker that I've got coming in on Friday on the three-day training. <clears throat> but let's get back to today. For today, what I thought I'd talk about is a couple of key things that you need to be aware of that are happening all around you. You can see it, you know it. But I really want to focus it on literally a phone call that I just had with a client. A client might even be on here. I just hung up with her and her husband. Uh, they have a sizable portfolio managed by a brokerage that many of you have probably heard of, Edward Jones. And uh, the advisor doesn't like what we did for her with the IBC stuff. So and I wasn't trying to pick a fight with an advisor or anything, but the advisor told her she should sell, get rid of her policy, cancel her policy, and take all the money and put it into mutual funds. 
According to Dave Ramsey, that would be a great recommendation. Actually, anyone see that Dave Ramsey video? He, or I think it was on like one of the news channels, right? How terrible whole life is. <clears throat> We're going to save that for another day. But uh, yeah, Dave Ramsey. Oh, Dave. Dave would be the first one to tell you, put your money into mutual funds right now. Buy the S&P 500. Buy that term insurance and then put the rest in investments because you can self-insure. By the time these mutual funds grow, to a certain point, you're, you're going to be self-insured. Your family will not need life insurance when your term insurance ends. That, that, anyway, that's essentially what Dave Ramsey tells you to do. And, you know, a lot of people follow that. I love what Dave Ramsey does with the, the, the baby steps and with the envelopes thing, because it really helps. It, it does. It helps people get out of debt. But can Dave Ramsey just stay in his lane? Well, he could if he didn't own an insurance brokerage that only sells term insurance. And he could if he didn't you know, have a brokerage company that does real estate. He's got to make sure he's getting greased everywhere, right? And then he's got his financial advisors, which are his elite financial advisors. You know, any of you, any of you that are an advisor, if you want to be one of Dave's elite financial advisors, his whatever he calls them, you just write him a check. Yeah, I'm sure there's a little background check. Make sure you got no dings on your your licenses, but you just write him a check every month. No problem. You're one of the elite. You're going to get the leads from Dave Ramsey's elite financial advisors. And now those advisors more than likely will tell you what this Edward Jones advisor told our client. Put your money in the market. Now, let's go one step deeper into this. So the first thing I did, and this is what I did when I was an advisor, and Stephen did the same thing. When we'd meet with a client for the first time, we would do what would be called a suitability, a needs analysis. It's very simple. You, you find out what the needs and goals are of your client. Kind of important when you're giving financial advice and helping people with their finances, right? Like, you don't recommend things to somebody unless you understand what their needs and goals are. And you don't recommend things to somebody unless it's suitable based on their risk tolerance, which is the risk reward profile. That's what they call it. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that the advisor fills out and plugs in answers from your questions. And it comes out with a number or basically kind of tells you what your baseline portfolio is. Now, I did this hundreds, if not maybe even thousands of times during my 16 years as, as an advisor, oftentimes with clients that were 60 to 70 years old, the, the suitability report or the suitability form would, would signify that the client is a preservation of principle portfolio recommendation, which is you know bonds and income producing assets, but very, very little in equities. So this client fits that criteria. I asked them all those questions. Very low risk tolerance. Can't really afford to, to lose money. Don't want to work anymore. We're retired. Like Don't want to take on excessive risk. Don't really need to grow the portfolio much. We have enough money. As long as this this can create an income, like we have enough money. Like we don't really need to grow it, but we'd, we'd like to grow it. I mean, who, who doesn't want to grow, right? So all of that, basically, if I did a needs analysis on them, it would come up probably with a preservation of principle. So what makes up a preservation of principle type of portfolio, you know, like this, if we were looking? Well, it would primarily be cash. It would probably be things like gold, precious metals, maybe as a hedge. And then it would be probably bonds. And we can define bonds, treasury bonds, if it's a non-qualified portfolio, maybe municipal bonds because of tax savings, maybe some AAA rated corporate bonds. But it wouldn't say go all in on high yield bonds. Do any, do any, can I just ask real quick, out of the hundred people we have, do any of you own high yield corporate bonds right now? Well, if any of you do, get rid of them. They're they're toxic, literally toxic. And you'll be in for a real upset pretty soon on them. So if you have those, I would definitely get rid of them. I'm glad that not many of you do. But a preservation of principle portfolio would basically be positioning a portfolio so that it really is preserving the principle. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you've got a million bucks, 500,000 bucks, $100,000 in your retirement, the goal of a preservation of principle is to preserve it, bar none. Now, there's also other models. It could be a preservation of principle with income, you know, there's a whole bunch of categories, which of which I can't remember all of them. But if the income piece comes in, let me just draw this. If you if you haven't taken a loan out of your 401k to pay off your high interest rate debt, um, now would be a good time to look at doing that. This is simple, folks. So I want to kind of just preface, you know, some some very simple things that every single one of you on here can do with your portfolio. Sorry, I'm not bringing the energy I normally do. I just can't talk. All right, so let's say somebody's got, I'm just gonna use round numbers. If yours isn't this, then whatever. Let's just use a million bucks. Somebody's got a million bucks and their portfolio is preservation of principle with income. So what we'd wanna do is we'd wanna design a portfolio that solved that problem. Preservation of principle. 
and then income. Now, you see how I drew a line <clears throat> down the middle? What I want to do is I want to make sure that I cover these two things. Preservation of principle can be done right now, money markets. Anyone know what money markets are paying right now? I, I, I know it's, it's like five point or 4.7 up to like almost 6%. Like by all intensive purposes, like that is a great return on your money. Bar none, it's a great equity return. There's no one on here. Well, some of you have, you know, been around this campfire for a while. So you're like 5%, shoot, I'm getting 15% with the Fullers. Uh, man, I'm getting 12% with Rude. Like private money clubs got deals all day long for 12 and 15%. Like, what is this nonsense 5%? <laughs> I know, not guys and gals, not everybody knows about that yet. So we got to kind of baby step. Remember Dave Ramsey, baby steps? So here, here's what we used to do as advisors. Stephen, chime into this. So if I know money markets right now, we can get about 5%, basically no risk. I mean, you could even buy CDs, but I'm not going to use that swear word. And then over here, let's just use T-bills, okay? Treasury bonds, but they're just T-bills, like two months to one years, okay? So T-bills, shoot, I think I just saw one that was like 5.8%, but whatever. Let's just say, we'll just say 5.5%. We can go treasury bonds, okay? We could go 10-year treasury bonds here. We could do a portfolio there. I mean, those are probably paying four to five there. And then you could go 20 plus year, long-term. And you could probably get upward of almost 6% on those. Right now, with any of these right here, <clears throat> is there any risk? Stephen, any risk with uh, 20 plus year, T-bond, treasury bonds, treasury bills, or money markets? Where's your risk? Essentially, no. Yeah, essentially, no. I mean, you got some interest rate risk, but I would, I would be very safe to say that most of the interest rate risk in treasury bonds right now is, is kind of out of it because the Fed's already done the majority of their increases in interest rates. So the treasury bonds are incredibly low. It, like the price of them that you can buy them, like if you go into ETFs and happy to share any of the ones that I do, not as a recommendation or a suggestion or anything, but just show you what I'm doing. The price of them are very low. So the interest rate risk is, is very much out. But then let's just say over here, the remaining portion of this portfolio, we need income to live on. All right, so on a million bucks, how much income does somebody need? I don't know. How, how much income, do, does anyone want to say how much income anyone needs? Like, what would you guys need to live? We can just pick anybody. You got a million bucks, 40 grand. I was, I was going to say a couple hundred grand. 8,000 a month. <clears throat> there you go, 250. 250. Well, let's just do a couple. Let's do, all right, so... Let me just do some numbers. So income, we need 96,000, which would be 8,000 a month. Okay, let's do that. So 96,000 into a million bucks. We need a 9.6, I should have been able to do that. That's why I did a million, easy math. 9.6% return, 40,000 is a 4% return. So if you only needed 40 grand, what are you gonna do? Shoot, you're just gonna put the money all in money markets for now. This is just for now, like this, you remember, what we set here can be changed tomorrow. It can be changed next month. It can be changed a year from now. And you can do all this. You don't need an advisor that charges you 1% to do this. This is simple stuff, okay? Uh, what were some of the other ones? 100,000, that's easy. That's 10%. So 100,000, 10%. So you can see we can kind of dial the income piece in based on the assets that we have. But the thing we cannot afford to do, and this is what I want to be clear about, see these numbers I did on the income side? If somebody needed 96,000, we got to make 9.6%. That's if we don't lose any money. We can't lose any money if, if we need to make 9.6%, okay? The worst possible thing that could happen is you stay invested in the market, you lose 30%. Now, we got, got 700,000 bucks. You wanna see the impact? So you got 700,000 bucks now and you need 96,000 a year. 96,000 a year divided into 700. Nothing changed in this dynamic. The only thing that happened is you stay in, you stayed in the market. You didn't, you didn't make changes. Your advisor didn't make changes. You were shooting for the moon and you lost 30%, very likely in a recessionary period. Now, all of a sudden, instead of making 9.6, you got to make 13.7. Okay, let's do this one. You need hundred grand, hundred grand divided into 700. You got to make 14.2%. Some of you that are in private money club are being like, no, no problem. I can make that. I can make that. Heck, I can get 15%. But you see the impact? When we lose principal, the whole game changes. The whole game changes because now one of two things has to happen. You have to make more of a return, which in some cases requires you to take more risk, or you got to affect your standard of living and you got to take more money. 
That makes sense to everybody? Hopefully it does, okay? So here's a, here's a cool strategy. I just wanted to run through that for income. If you got a portfolio like this and you design it for preservation of, of uh, income, but over here, we basically say, all right, 300,000 is gonna go for income. So now we move 300,000. And if this was an IRA, we could move this into a self-directed IRA where we have full control to do whatever. You find a deal on PMC, 300K, probably get you 13. Let's just do 13%, 300,000 times 0.13, 39,000 bucks. So we shifted part of the million dollar portfolio to be income. We moved it out of the traditional retirement account into a self-directed IRA. We then found a deal that would provide 13%, which wouldn't be hard at 300, you could probably get more. And that covers $39,000 of whatever your need is from your portfolio. And then we can basically come back over here. Let's just say these, and let's just average these, average these out at 5%. We'll just say these are all 5%. That's the other 700,000 is making 5%. So that's another, so over here, 5% and 700K is equal to $35,000 a year. So now we got 39 plus 35 income. Now we're doing a lot better, right? And we're doing it with very little risk because this 300,000 in this self-directed IRA lent through a private money club deal making 13% is secured by whatever, the real estate, whatever you're investing in or whatever you're lending on, secured, okay? Over here, these three bonds are secured by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Hopefully you still believe in it. The money markets, what are they secured by? Well, typically by an institution with a $250,000 FDIC guarantee. So see how we literally, all we did is shifted things in what you're already doing. I didn't talk about the infinite banking concept. I didn't talk about really anything fancy. All we did is everything that you can already do, not hard at all. Like this would literally, for you to find things like this to invest your portfolio in, you could easily do it. Go into your 401k, look for something that says government bonds. Look for money markets, look for stable value inside of a, a Schwab, TD Ameritrade, or any other brokerage account. Look for treasury bond ETFs, do some research, send me an email, shoot me a message on DM. I'll, I'll send you over what, what treasury bonds I do. I, I buy all durations of treasury bonds. This is not a forever portfolio. This is a today portfolio that gets you through what could be a pretty rough period of time. This could be a really rough period of time. Think of it as driving down the road. You're coming up on a really rough part. You know the road, you know it well, and there's a part where they just need to pave the thing. It's rough. Your car slows down, right? We're just slowing the car down. We're not slowing your income down. We're just repositioning income assets to be here. This is another thing you all should and could be doing. Let's just say you hate this. That's fine to each their own. It's not for everybody. Let's just say you want to stay completely invested. You think the markets are going to go up. You're bullish. You got a good outlook. You're thinking everything's going to be fine. The dude is going to take us to high levels. He's going to take us to the moon. Okay, great. So we just get rid of all of this. You keep your portfolio heavily invested in the markets. We'll call it the S&P 500, okay? Just because that's a favorite one, which by the way is held up by seven stocks. Actually, can I show you guys something? All right, so this is the S&P 500. This is 20 years. Nice, smooth, right up, but not really, right? Look at that. Here's the pandemic. Here's where we're at just off of the highs. So if we were to start drawing some lines here, like that's your high point. Don't really have much to go on here. Really, your real stability is back here. So these are support and resistance levels, trend lines, as you would call them. I mean, we could even start doing trend lines. We could go up like this and do channeling. Um, I, I'm kind of just butchering this, but you can see what's going on in the trend lines is right here. <clears throat> you can see here, we got a lot of movement, but in a narrowing channel. And all that means, if we were to really zoom in on this and I was to get a little bit more technical with my drawings, things are narrowing, which typically means if we were to project this out, if I could draw these lines, eventually they touch. And that's typically the way a market's going to run. But baby's crying. All right, Duckby. Uh, but chances are this thing isn't going to test the all-time highs. Does, I mean, does anyone on here truly, I had somebody on what the F happened that was bullish. So they might think, but 2022 was the highest point ever. Okay. You can see it right there on the S&P. And we, we're going back to 2005. We could even go longer. Does anyone truly believe we're going to test that top line, that, that high point in the market? Anyone? I mean, does anyone truly think that we're going to be higher than this? 
do we have enough oomph left in the, the economy? Is the government going to print any more money? Or sorry, not the government, the, the Fed going to print any more money to try to drive us through printed money to a higher point? I don't know, Jerome Powell sort of told us no. He's actually going to keep interest rates higher. They're going to keep pulling back on their balance sheet and un, you know maturing bonds off or unwinding their balance sheet, as they call it. So I, I just don't see where this is a difficult decision for anyone to make. Whether you're a risk taker or not, I just don't see what there is left in it. You know, it'd be like you're in a car, right? You're in your car. You put the pedal all the way down and the car is going to go as fast as a car can go, right? Can the car go any faster? Is there anything that's going to make that car go faster? Maybe if you're going downhill, okay? But we're, we're not, we're going uphill. There's nothing left that the car can give you. I'm sorry I'm doing these car analogies, but it's just like you, you drive every day, so you get this. This is as fast as the car can go. I don't think we're going to exceed where we were. Chances are we're going that way, okay? But I just wanted to point out, like, when your advisors are telling you to be in the market, like, what's left in the market? What, what is there left here? Okay, now let me just do one more. It's treasury bonds. Okay, now, a little different look here, right? Look at this son of a pup. Man, it's almost like somebody freaking, you know, somebody did something bad here. Look at this downward slope. Holy cow. I hope you didn't own it up here. What is this? Treasury bonds. What happened? The Fed happened, folks. The Fed raised interest rates and is continuing to, which is driving, pressuring it down. See here, this is, so like right here, if you remember not long ago, this is when the Fed was like thinking, people were thinking they were going to pause and they did, and they didn't think it was going to go any any higher. And then now the Fed said, no, I we're not really where we are. So look at what it did to the price. It drove the price way down. Looking at this chart, can anyone double top drop? I love it. We got some traders. What does anyone, when you look at this chart, folks, I, I just want everybody's honest opinion. When you look at this chart, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you look at this point right here? Stephen, what do you, what do you see when you see this? Like, what's the first thing you think of? It's it's falling like a rock. I mean, we're okay. low, low prices. We're towards the bottom. Okay. Bye, bye, bye. All right. What else? Does anyone else think? I lost all my money. Was that in Las Vegas or were you in uh, Atlantic City? Because nobody lost all their money in the stock market yet. Good time. To, okay. That's what I was looking for. Sam, I, I was just waiting for this. What does Warren Buffett say? Buy low, sell high. Is this not low? Does that not look low? We're, we're 20 years. This is one of the lowest points in 20 freaking years to buy treasury bonds from the United States government. So I'm surprised that only one person said, well, actually, it was a couple of people said, that's a buying opportunity. Look at that. But then some people would be like, well, what if it keeps going lower? Well, then it probably will. If the Fed keeps raising rates, it'll probably go lower. But you know, here's the thing. You can never time the market. You can never time your buy. You'll never get it right. You know, I've been buying this stupid thing during, I've been buying this all the way down. It won't let me show you the portfolio, but I'm down quite a bit. I'm down definitely quite a bit on that one because I've been buying it the whole way. Whoa. All right. I'm going to exit out of this because you guys are getting bored of looking at charts, but that's really what I was looking for. <laughs> that's a major buying opportunity. But here's the good news. Although that scares some people to look at that chart, you got to put your fear aside and you got to use logic. Don't invest emotionally. Okay, because if you invest emotionally, you're going to be bullish. You're going to be buying into stocks. You're going to be doing what that advisor told, you know, our client. Buy, buy, buy. Buy more mutual funds. Put more in the S&P 500. Buy at the highest point. How did that work for anyone that bought Bitcoin? And I know a lot of you bought Bitcoin. Where'd you buy it? 40, 50, 60? How many of you literally were inclined and thinking, oh my God, it's 60. It's going to go to the moon. I should buy. And then what happened? Well, I don't know. What was the low point it hit? 11,000? 60 down to 11,000. That's people, emotions make you buy wrong. Logic makes you buy right. Logic tells you that the, the reason that treasury bond chart that you just looked at is so low is because the Fed's been raising rates. So rates have been going up. Hence, the price of the bonds have been going down. Let me show it to you in a different way. There it is. Simple. Interest rates go up. Price of bonds goes down. Oh, look at this, Stephen. Remember when we did this training? They were paying three to four. Now they're like 5.5%. Wild, huh? That's crazy, right? So price goes down when interest rates go up. What you saw is this. You saw this cycle, price going down. Can it go lower? Yeah. Will it go lower? Probably a little bit, but you're pretty much at the bottom, at least roundabout speaking. 
If you lose another five, 10%, here's the good news. What's gonna happen next? We'll be in a recession. 84% of CEOs say that we're, we're gonna land in a recession. 48% of economists say we're gonna land in a recession. The inverted yield curve says 60, 68%, I think, percentage of us landing in a recession. Consumers say 69% of consumers say we're gonna be in a recession. I mean, I don't need to keep going. Like, we're gonna be there. And when we get there, what will the Fed do? Well, the same damn thing they do every time. They control monetary policy. They'll drop interest rates. And what will happen to the price of those stupid, silly bonds that you bought in that preservation of principle? They're gonna go up. And what are you gonna do when they go up? Who can tell me what you're gonna do when they go up? You're not gonna buy. You're gonna sell. That's right. Because you buy low and you sell high. Let's just do that again. You buy low and you sell high. Everybody's got that, right? So let's now flip it from treasury bonds. And let's just talk about all your holdings that you have right now. Mid caps, large cap, large cap growth, large cap value, developed nations, international growth. You know, you guys got them all. Where are they? High. I could pull up every one of them. If you guys just started putting tickers in there, I put them in the, I'll put them into TD Ameritrade. I'll show you. High, high, high. They're all at the high point. What do you do when things are high? You sell. But why don't people sell? Oh, it's down this week. Oh, I'm, I, I, looked at my, my, I looked at my statement and it's down a thousand bucks. I don't want to sell now. I'm going to wait for it to come back. What if it doesn't come back? What if it goes down another 20%? Oh, well, I'm going to wait for it to come back. What if it goes down 30%? You're going you to keep waiting? Oh, I'm probably going to wait till it comes back. What about when it hits 40? Oh, no, at 40, I'd, I'd have to sell. I'd, I'd have to sell. Can't, can't, can't afford to lose anymore. I, 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 Mercy, you know, uncle, uncle. Does this sound familiar, folks? Because I'm, I'm literally giving, I'm literally reciting everything I've heard for 16 years. It's actually been 20 years now. This is what people do. They invest emotionally, not logically. Because if you just invested logically, every one of you would be changing their portfolios. Many of you actually, no, we actually gained followers. A lot of people would have been you know, leaving this webinar, going in, liquidating parts of their portfolio and finding treasuries or money markets or stable values or whatever in your portfolio to go to that preservation of principle. Nothing's permanent, folks. When you sell a stock, a mutual fund, or ETF, can you not buy it back the next day? Well, let's just say a week later. So if I owned Apple today and Apple was up and I had a gain in Apple, if I sell Apple today in an IRA, let's forget about the taxes. So inside of an IRA or 401k, I sell Apple. I made money. Can I buy Apple back next week? Yep. And if Apple goes down and I buy it back next week, was that a good move? Yep. So if I buy a treasury bond ETF today and it goes up in a month, can I sell it in a month? Yep. And if the whole market drops immediately and I'm in money markets, can I sell the money market and immediately buy the S&P 500 that I love so much? Yep. You see what I'm trying to get across? None of this is permanent. This isn't rocket science. We're not constructing booster rockets that takes SpaceX rockets to the moon where it has to be precise. We're not engineering something that has to be absolutely perfect. Done is way better than perfect in this scenario. That's, that's what I'm trying to get across to you folks. A lot of you have 401ks. If you got a 401k and you don't know what to do with it, take a loan. I'm serious. Like literally like, if you've got a 401k and you're like, I don't know how to do all this stuff, call up your 401k, say, hey, I'm just wondering, uh, can I take a loan? Oh, sure. You can take 50,000 or 50%, whichever is greater. Great. Can you send me a check for the loan? Yeah. 401k will say no problem. Great. Now they send you a loan for 50 grand. What are you going to do with that 50 grand? Well, you're going to make that money go to work for you. But let's just say over on this side of your balance sheet or your budget, you've got debts, credit cards, car loans. We're going to take the 50 grand and we're going to pay off your debts from lowest balance to highest. We're going to take every penny of what those debts were costing you, 350, 200, 50, 500. And whatever we pay them off, when we pay them off, we're going to take the money you were giving to Visa, MasterCard, Amazon, and the car finance company, and we're going to send it back to your 401k. What's your blended return? Well, if it was 25, 20, 15, and 3%, that averages out at 15.75%. How many of you want to make 15.75% on your 401k right now with no risk? Anyone? I just showed you how. The fastest way to wealth is through your own debts and expenses, folks.
Like, why would you keep your money in the 401k when it's going down, down, and down? Like, take the loan, pay off the debts, take the money, send it back over there. But you see, in this scenario, a lot of you think 15.75 is a lot, but it's nothing because your 401k is going to charge you interest on the loan. That's probably 8% now. Can, Stephen, can you do the math? What's 15.75 plus 8? 23.75, right? Yeah, 23.75%. So how do you like those apples? You just made 23.75. But some of you are like, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 I don't, I don't understand. The 401k loan cost me 8%. I got to pay, I got to pay 8% on that loan. Yes, indeed, you do have to pay 8% on that loan. That's the interest charged. But who charged it? Your 401k. So when you pay it back, where does the 8% go? Into your 401k. It's like a, it's like a baked in guaranteed 8% on your money. But you got to make sure that the 50 grand goes to work. Do not take the 50 grand out and go to Las Vegas and put it all on black. Okay. Well, it's got to go yeah. to work for you. Right, Stephen? I mean, I, I mean, maybe, but Stephen's putting it all risk on tolerance. black. Depends on your risk tolerance. Yeah. W would you take yours out and put it on black? Nah, red red 23, it? baby. Red 23. <laughs> is this all making sense, folks? This is so simple. I even hate sometimes teaching this, but this is such, this is so important. It, it is pretty crazy that a 401k requires to pay interest back to yourself. It's like they just give us all your money into the 401k, you know? Wild. It is crazy. It is good that they pay it back, though. My average price is like $23. Uh, it's currently $170. I don't, I'm not really sure what that's about. So I'm looking here. Rick Smith said, does the 401k loan liquidate your holdings in order to give you the loan? Absolutely. Hence why I said that. Remember, buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. To take the loan from your 401k, your 401k will, will basically go through and it will liquidate $50,000 worth of money from all of your your portfolio from all of your assets, whatever mutual funds you have. Usually it does it on a pro rata basis or equally amongst all. You can, I think some of them allow you to pick. So some of them you could go in and you could just, you know, just liquidate just cash to get you the 50. And I'm pretty sure you can do that on most of your online portals. But yes, that's the point. When the market's high, you take the loan from the 401k, you send it out to work at a higher rate. That's all you do, right? And, and then you put the money back in the 401k. This is another really super easy thing. And I'm sorry, I, I, I my mind's not all there today, but I started to say this and I forgot. Let's just say somebody doesn't want to sell any of their stocks. They're okay. But if, you, if you're somebody that's retired, you need money. You're going to need money to live. You never know when you're going to need money. So this is just a smart practice for everybody. Inside of any portfolio, you can always, always, always carve out a portion for cash or money markets. So what I would suggest everybody does, depending on your portfolio, figure out how much money you need to live for a year, 12 months. And this is, this is a retirement portfolio primarily that I'm talking about, but this could be any portfolio. Doesn't matter really what it is, but let's just focus on retirement. So you've got a, a million dollar portfolio and you've got it all invested. Let's just put S, let's just put S and P 500. All of it's in the S and P 500. You still need income. So if the market goes down, you don't want to draw from the S and P 500. When the S and P is going down, you don't want to take withdrawals when it's going down because you destroy the portfolio. So what we would always do is a side fund. Okay. So we would basically just do a side cash fund. And sometimes we would use bonds, but you know, so here, let's say we kept 700,000 in the S and P and you moved 300,000 to cash. What this is for is so that when you need to take a withdrawal, you're only going to take a withdrawal from cash. You're only going to take the money from the account that doesn't go down. Hence why I said a money market fund. So if I needed a withdrawal for 30,000 this month because we had our taxes come due, next month I need a withdrawal for 10,000 just to live. Next month I need a withdrawal for 20,000, whatever. I mean, maybe it's 5,000, maybe I need the next month only 5K. If the markets are going down, if the S&P is going down, where is this money coming from? Is it coming from the S&P 500? No, it's coming from this reserve account, okay? You guys have emergency funds for your money in the bank. Why don't you have one in your retirement accounts if you need an income, especially if you're retired or close to retirement? This is, you got to do this. Just it's a little side hustle, a little side cash account that you're going to take withdrawals from. Every portfolio should have one of these, but so few do. So few do. I, I don't know why. Sometimes I, I think advisors just don't even know how to do their job. Can anyone tell me what a financial advisor's number one job is? So, 
a lot of you said a lot of things, assets under management, sell products. Uh, I'm not saying any of those are wrong, but their number one job is to know what to do when things go bad. The number one job of an advisor is to help a client navigate market conditions. Primarily, how hard is it to navigate market conditions like the last 12 years where markets are going up and you can just throw darts? Is that hard? Not really. I mean, does it matter if one person makes 12 and the next person makes 15? Is anyone really, really getting upset if your advisor only made you 12 and your buddy's advisor made, you made him 15? Not really. But now let's flip it. We enter a recession. Now you got an advisor. Your buddy's advisor positioned you in a preservation of principal portfolio where you lost 2%. You are down 30%. Did your advisor do what they should have done? Did the advisor act when they should have acted? No. Did the other? Did your friends? Yep. An advisor's job is to protect clients when markets are going sideways or down or when we're in turbulent market conditions. That is the number one job of an advisor because all of you can make money in an upward market. All of you can invest your money when the markets are doing well. It's easy. Just throw darts. They actually did a study. Remember that, Stephen, where they threw darts? The monkeys threw darts? But see, most people, when they think of an advisor, like, oh, an advisor's job is to make me money. And you know what? That's exactly what advisors think their job is to do. But the advisors don't know how to make money when the economic conditions are changing underneath them because all they've known, most of them, most of them haven't been around longer than 12 years. Most of them only know an upside to the market. Do you want to take advice from somebody that's never invested clients' money during a recessionary period? I bet you a lot of you are. I bet you a lot of you are working with an advisor that has never managed your anyone's assets in economic instability or hard market conditions. If you're taking advice in real estate, is, is the person you're taking advice from, have they been through 2008? Have they been through the dot-com crash in real estate? Do they know what the downside is? I don't know. Just trying to point it out. You ever feel like you don't have control of your real estate business or your money? That's right. The big banks and the institutions, they're in control, right? I know you've felt that before. Private Money Club puts you back in the driver's seat. As members often tell us, it's a total game changer. Join the community of like-minded lenders and borrowers by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. All right, Stephen, where should we go from here? You want to talk a little bit of IBC? Yeah, what's everybody want to learn about? There's not a lot of questions coming in, so I feel like a lot of people are getting bored of me talking. I mean, we're losing yeah, Don, a couple of people. Uh, Don was asking, you know, what kinds of, um, you know, there's a lot of different treasury bonds and options, you know, maybe some of the differences in them. Um, I have a list of the ETFs you've mentioned in the past, if you want me to. Do you want to just post that in the chat? Mm -hmm. And I just, I, just underneath that, if you can just put, this is not a recommendation or suggestion or financial advice. These, yeah. these that he's going to post, folks, just for the record, this is being recorded. These are the, the, these are the ETFs with treasury bonds and T-bills that I buy okay, in my portfolios. <laughs> so I'm not making a recommendation. I'm just going to show you what I buy. Please do your own due dil diligence. Please consult with your financial advisor to see if this is a suitable investment for your needs and goals. Oh, and by the way, does your advisor actually know what your needs and goals are? Do they even know what your suitability is? Has your suitability changed from when we were in a bull market to where we're going? These things all have to be discussed. When Those you get on the floor, I had. Did I did I miss any new ones? This, this was no, fun. I don't. I don't have a ton of them. Yeah, there there might be a couple. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten of them. I'll send them to you again. Okay, I was jotting those down from somebody over the summer, but I'm sure, there's. Uh, this is probably a stupid question. Any input on SQQQ or hedge, or get the hell out of. No, I'm not saying get the hell out of everything other. I mean, SQQ, that's a that's an inverse, right? I would guess. Yeah, let me look it up. There's so many tickers out there. I, 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 there's no way I can know what they all are. Yeah, ultra short. So it's an ultra, it's a shorting the markets. I don't know. It's up 7.68% today. It looks like it's doing here. Actually, let me look. You're probably stuck. Yeah, you're, you, if you were in this for the year, you, you got crushed. But that's okay because this isn't. It's it's an ultra short, which means you're shorting the market, but you're ultra shorting the market. So, you know, S for SQQQ, any of these these leveraged funds like this, you got to be really careful. I mean, listen, if you get it right, you're going to get it really right. But these are these are usually positions that you use to hedge a portfolio. Uh, these are positions you'd use if you really feel solid that the market's going to go down, and and you you can kind of time it a little bit. Although timing the market is next to impossible, um, I don't play with these. 
you know, I, I have the VIX, but that's volatility and I'm sucking wind on the VIX. So if you're going to do SQQQ, I would be very careful because if, if the, you can't fight the Fed and if the Fed, you know, keeps doing certain things or the markets keep staying resilient, you're going to, you're going to continue to lose. But I think looking at the chart over a year or even five years, this looks like a really good entry point in that one as well, which I think you'll find in any short or, or any inverse uh, fund or ETF because the markets have been more bullish than they have been bearish. So anybody that invested in these has lost a lot. This thing's sitting at 21, 21.85 uh, per share. So that's my only take on that. Corporate structure for private money lenders starting out, either just lend individually and, and then it would be ordinary income, or you could create a, probably just an, a, either a partnership or a, you know, just a sole LLC or something like that. If you want to take an income from it, maybe an S corp. Can you invest in these with Horizon Trust? Absolutely. Steve, you want to hit on that a little bit? Like the ETFs using a self-directed IRA? Yeah. I mean, you would, you would, so with the self-directed IRA, you can hook it to a TD Ameritrade or Schwab account. And uh, at least with Horizon, you know, it depends on who your custodian is. And then you just buy them that way. It basically just connects the two accounts so you can move the money back and forth because you're not necessarily self-directing the money into an ETF. You still need a brokerage account to do that. So, so, so yeah, you can do it with any IRA, I should say. I guess it doesn't have to be self-directed. Yeah, when you take a 401k loan, you do liquidate the, the whatever it's invested in. They, they liquidate that to cash and then you don't maintain your position. Please verify, it's Robert. Verify my understanding. When I take out a whole life policy, and they're specially designed whole lives, this is really specially designed, uh, and do forty to fifty thousand dollar dump in, do I still have to continue paying premiums forever? Change your mindset. You're not paying premiums. You're making premium deposits. Do you want to make deposits in your bank forever? Do you want to continue making deposits in your bank to the day you die? I sure hope so. This is your new bank. This is not make payments. If you think of this as payments, please don't do this. Don't book a call. Don't even watch the 90 minute video. If you can't change the mindset that this is going to be used as savings, you're going to change one thing where your savings goes. You're not taking on new expenses. Okay. That's not what we're doing here. You're changing where your savings goes. So here, this woman, 47 year old, healthy female had 450 grand or more. She had more than that, but that was her savings. She changed where that 450 went. She dumped it into a specially designed whole life. She then every year decided she wanted to save because she was already saving $50,000. So she wanted to save 50,000 bucks. We built a plan to hold $50,000 a year in deposits. If she doesn't have the ability after the first year to do 50,000, well, the first year she just put 500 in. But after that, if she doesn't have or doesn't want to continue putting 50, she can go down to as low as 24,324. This is not a payment. And if you think of this as a payment, again, don't do this. Don't do this until you get your mindset right. When you create your own private banking system, you're not, you're not taking on new expenses. You're not making new payments. You're actually trying to take back the banking function in your life by creating a banking system. Called, and it's called the infinite banking concept. The definition of the infinite banking concept is the process, not the product, the process of taking back the banking functions in your life. That is what it is. Okay? So... This is The Rock. This is One America. This is a unique plan, not available to every client. It has to be a large dump in and a sizable premium deposit. We usually say about 50000 for this design to work. But all I want to do is explain, like the person puts five hundred k in. With what we teach with the infinite banking concepts, the number one thing I want to preface is the goal is not to just put money in a whole life and just leave it there. This is not for that. Okay, I'm just going to say that. Is that the worst possible thing you could do? No. But it's just not. That's not the infinite banking concept. That's just you buying a whole life policy. And this is where the, <clears throat> the rubber meets the road with Dave Ramsey is Dave Ramsey doesn't understand the infinite banking concept at all. Not at all. I have not seen one video where he can articulate what the infinite banking concept is. He just says it's a scam. Okay. Well, I mean, if it's a scam, please explain how I, Stephen, I think we have what, about eight, almost 8,000 clients in the United States, all using the infinite banking concepts. Mm -hmm. And none of them are mad at us. If you had 8,000 clients as an advisor, Stephen, would one of them be mad at you too? Probably a lot of them, right? So oh, how yeah. is this a scam if it's working for over, over we'll say over 7,000 people? No, I mean, I've said that for a long time, Chris. I mean, like the first 
first like two years, I was helping a lot of clients get started. And, you know, I've been in various different sales roles and, and consultant roles and, um, you know, different, different positions I've had throughout my careers and, and life. And you always have people that are upset for one reason or another, whether it's something that you said or they misunderstood or, you know, market conditions change and it changes the whole. And, and, you know, now that I've been doing this now for four years, I've still yet to have a single person that just complained for any reason, you know, whether it was any aspect of any of it, like never, ever. And that's just, I've, it's, I've never seen that in my life. I never even knew that was possible. So it's, it definitely is a testament to what we do for sure. Yeah. So, and uh, folks, all I'm showing you here is this is the product. This is the specially designed whole life. This is not what's going to make you wealthy. I'm just being honest, the, the whole life is not going to make you wealthy. It'll preserve your money. It'll protect your money. It'll give you a death benefit, you know, for your family. It'll allow you a, a tax-free environment to grow your money, but this is not going to make you wealthy. The second part of this, the uh, the part that I just mentioned, the process is what's going to make you wealthy. And, and I want to just, I just want to explain that, but I want you to know this is not a magic thing. This is not a magic widget that's going to all of a sudden make you wealthy because you put money in a whole life. Matter of fact, just the opposite. If you put 500,000 in, in your first year, you only have access to 91% in this design, 458,133. You put 500 in, you have 458,133 that you can take out. Now, people all the time like say, oh, that sucks. I can't take all my money. But yet then they'll go and put their money in the S&P 500. And right now, it'd probably be about the same. Probably depending on when you bought the S&P 500 or the index or whatever index you're in, you're probably down. So it's probably about the same thing. <clears throat> but buying the S&P 500 doesn't give you a death benefit of 10672000 and change. So that when you die, there's $10 million that's paid out in this woman's scenario, paid out to her family. Uh, I've never seen a mutual fund that does that. I've never seen an ETF that does that. Year two, she puts in a premium deposit, not a premium payment, not a premium expense, not this cost, a premium deposit. And she has 37,000 of the 49,000 available. Again, that sucks, doesn't it? Some of you are like, why would anyone do this? Dave Ramsey was right. Dave Ramsey was right. Only had 91% of all the money available year one and year two. Like you're, you're 37,000 of 49,000 or 50,000 will round up. Yep. You want to know why that is? Well, Dave Ramsey tells you why. All oh, those whole life policies, they're overpriced, expensive insurance policies that the advisors get big commissions. Our commission on this was on 24,000, not 500. Our commission would be generated from that. So I don't know, maybe it's uh, 16, maybe 2,000 bucks we'd make in commission. This would be literally 90% less than a regular whole life would pay out. So it's because the way it's built. So we get paid a commission. How, does, how do we get paid a commission? The insurance company pays us. And how do they pay us? Well, because they charge for this death benefit. Yep, it's bad news. $10,672,000 death benefit should this woman pass away. It's paid tax-free to her family. That shit ain't free. The insurance company does charge for that death benefit. Now, what you don't know is quite a bit of this $10 million, about $6 million of that $10 million is what Dave Ramsey always says. What does Dave Ramsey always say? Come on, someone help me. I forgot what Dave Ramsey always says. What does he say? Don't buy whole life, buy what? Term, right? Out of this $10 million, would you believe that Dave Ramsey has never thanked us because six million of that 10 is term insurance? That's right. Dave, dude, you don't even know what we do. We do exactly what you say to do. We buy term, dude. Why? Because it's cheap, man. And what do we do with the difference? We invest it. We loan it out on real estate deals. We pay off our credit card debts. We don't use envelopes. No, no, no. We use this thing called the... Uh, we'll just call it a specially designed whole life that pays us interest and dividends on every penny that we take out of it, even though the money is out paying off debts. Dave, do you have magic envelopes that pay you compounding interest on the money after you take it out of the envelope? Because if you do, man, please let's talk. That Chris guy and that Steven guy said they will change all their presentations to use your special envelopes. And they're willing to pay you a monthly fee just to be able to say, we use Dave Ramsey's special envelope. And Dave Ramsey's special envelope pays you compounding interest uninterrupted on all the money that you ever put in the envelope, even if you take it out and use it to go make money investing the difference.
Come on, dude. Like, if you guys don't find that funny, man, I just suck. Because, like, that shit's funny. It is. Like, Dave Ramsey says, buy term, invest the difference. What do we do? We do almost the exact same thing. Not with all of it. Because 4 million of that, 10 million goes into that overpriced whole life policy, which is which is exactly why you only had 91% of in the first year and, and only 37 of the 50,000 in the second year. But Dave, what you don't understand, dude, is, shouldn't say dude, because there's only one dude. We'll call it Dave Ramsey, do that. What you don't understand, do that. We got to be very cautious on, there's only one dude right now. And you all know the dude, okay? But- Dave Ramsey's do that says, you know, we should never put money in a whole life. We should invest the difference. But Dave, Dave, I put 500,000 into that, that product that you told me. Six million of it went to term, the thing you said. And then I'm just going to invest the difference, dude. I'm going to do that. Sorry. Do that. I'm going to invest 458,000. Matter of fact, I'm going to take $458,000, Dave. I'm going to take that out of the policy and I'm going to pay off debt. Because you said that's bad. We got to pay all the debt off. Snowball that shit. Yeah, Dudette says, yep, that's exactly what I said. Great, but Dave, Dave, I couldn't find a magic envelope that paid me interest and dividends on all the money when I took it out of the envelope and I paid down those debts that you said. So I found a magic envelope. It was called a whole life policy with term insurance. And I'm still getting interest and dividends on all $458,000, Dave. The second year, Dave, Dudette, I did the same thing, man. I put 50 in, I took 37 of the 50 out and I paid off more debts. And then I took the money that I used to pay off or that I took the money from the debts that I used to give to the debtors and do that. All I did is I just paid that money back to the envelope, the magic envelope called the whole life. Yeah, yeah, that's all I did. You, you taught me to do that, Dave. You taught me well. But you see, do that the third year. This is the magic year. This is where the rubber meets the road, do that. I put 50,000 into that specially designed whole life. Yes, Dave, 6 million of that, 10 million death benefit is term insurance. We're just investing the difference. Okay, we got 50K, but how much can I take out now? 58. Dave, can your envelope do that? Just asking for a friend. Dave, can we put 50K in an envelope or whatever account you decide to tell us? Can we put 50K in and then take 58,000 out? No, here's what Dave would say. Dave would be like, yeah, but you lost money the first two years. You got to make up what you lost. Okay. Dave, we just made up uh, 8,000 of the 12, but hey, hold on, fourth year, we put another 50,000 premium deposits into that special envelope called a whole life. And now we could take 61,000 out, we made it 11,000. So now, Dave, in, in the four, third and fourth year, 11 plus eight is $19,000, actually almost a little more than that. We made up all the money from the second year that we lost, and we're now closing the gap on the third year. And then as it keeps going, by the fifth year, we put 50 in, we take 64 out. By the 10th year, we put 50 in in premium deposits. We take 77,000 out. Everybody picking up what I'm putting down? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the cash value is in the policy or taken out as a loan. These numbers don't change. Yes, we have to pay the insurance company interest, but let's just do some math. If in year three, I made 16% on my 50K that I put in, because that's the only number that we can count. Dave would disagree, but that's the only number we can count. We made a $50,000 deposit. That year, that $50,000 was worth $58,000. It's a 16% cash on cash return. These years do that, Dave. We took all that money out. We did what you told us. We paid debts down. Yeah, man, paid, we did what you said. And we took the money from the debts and we put it back in the policy. So 16% is what we made. Now, I know the insurance companies are greedy bastards. And they asked for 5% of that 16% back. They want 5% of that 16% back in interest. All right. So now we only made 11. The next year we put, we made 23%, but they asked for 5% of that back. Oh, crap. Dave was right. I only made 18% of my money. That envelope would have been way better. Next year was 28%. I got to give five back. You see what I'm saying? 55%, 200%, 263, 408. Do you understand why Dave Ramsey just doesn't understand how this works? And I haven't even got in to the infinite banking concept. I've just brushed the surface. Literally brushing the surface. But what had to happen for you to get to that point? You had to suck wind for two years. You had to suck wind for two years because you had to pay for the death benefit of which the death benefit is of $6 million of it is term insurance. You would have paid that with Dave Ramsey regardless because he tells you to buy term 
and invest the difference. We did the same thing, except for we didn't invest the difference. They, we put the difference in the insurance company, in their general account, where they guaranteed us a return on our money. Interest, guarantee, in this company, 3.25%, guaranteed for the life, for your life. Doesn't matter what the Fed does. Plus dividends, which gets you up in the 5% range with this company. That's all we did, Dave. We invested the difference, but we didn't invest it. We put it in a guaranteed place. We just didn't like the word investment because that involves risk. Is that okay, Dave? We just so you see, if I if I had a chance to talk to Dave, what if I just eliminated whole life and I just said I put it in an account and here's the things that it did. And here's exactly what I did to do exactly what you said. I bought I bought term insurance, Dave. And I put the money in this account that paid me guaranteed interest for the rest of my life. And oh yeah, every year I get a dividend. And the interest and the dividends that I earn on that, it's all tax-free. And I get to use the money that I put into that account without interrupting that interest and dividends because they just loan me money from their general account. They, they just collateralize it with the money that I have with that account. And then I just take it out and I do what you say. I pay debts off, but I take the money that I used to give the debts and I roll it back into this account. Does that change it for anyone? If I just eliminate whole life from the entire vocabulary of what we do? How many more, I, sometimes I wonder how many more people would do this and change their financial lives all I did was eliminate whole life, which I never will, because I can't, because it's illegal. But just imagine that. A world where instead of whole life, I just call it a magic account, or I just call it an account. Some people would say that account doesn't exist. They'd say, yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. It's always existed. It's been around for hundreds of years. Well, what is it? I can't tell you, because then you won't like it. Well, I already like it. You said it. it's got all those things, guaranteed interest and dividends, and it grows tax-free, and I can use the money and still earn interest on the money. It's like saving and spending at the same time. Like, of course I'm going to like it. Like, dude, just tell me. Oh, oh, wait, hold on. But if you die, your, your family gets a big death benefit. Well, yeah, well, that even sounds better. Like, what is it? I can't tell you. Just a special account. You want one? Oh, hell yeah, I want one. Oh, okay. All right. Here, fill this out. Oh, by the way, it's, uh, it's a whole life policy. Oh, I don't want that. Dave Ramsey said, no, I don't want that. Now let's get into something fun. Because like I said, that's not going to make you rich. But that sure is better than a sharp stick in the eye when it comes to how your money is working for you all the time. So if the 401k is investing in treasuries, the loan option doesn't seem as good as it would be selling low in order to liquidate for a loan. Well, you're, you're kind of combining two things. But all right, let's just hypothetically say, Rick, that somebody's got a 401k and all their money is in a government bond fund. Let's say it's in the G fund if you're a government uh, employee and you've got credit cards. You got credit cards that are uh, 20%. Would taking a loan out from your treasury bond, your government security bond fund in your 401k, would that make sense to pay off a credit card at 20%? How much are your treasuries making? Five, five and a half. How much is, are you paying Visa? 20 plus percent taking the money from the treasuries to pay off the credit card to then take the money from the credit card and put it back into the 401k makes all the sense in the world. Hopefully that made sense. Too many making senses. Should I contribute to 401k with employer match or put in IBC without match? I believe IBC would be better long-term, but looking for confirmation. How about both? Okay. How about both? What if you put into the 401k just up to the match, which is more than likely probably 3%, maybe at most 4%. So you put 3%. In there, and anything else that you would have put into your 401k, you put into IBC. Why not have both? I mean, some people love ice cream, but some people love ice cream with some whipped cream and peanuts on top. Why not have them both? Let's see, IBC question regarding loan repayments. Are repayments made along the way over time? Those recaptures are to the principal only. Then once a year, receive a separate line item to repay the interest accrued throughout that year. Is that correct? Yeah, we're going to cover that right now. Would you guys like me more if I wore a leather jacket? It would have to be a pleather jacket because I'm not going to wear an actual leather jacket. Would you guys like me more? I mean, I'll literally watch Suzy Q. I'll, I'll get a man style jacket of like what, or maybe, hell, I'll just get Suzy Q's jacket. If that'll make you like me more, I'll play ball. I'll do it. I want a gator skin one. Now, come on. If, if Steven wore a gator skin leather jacket, <laughs> would you show up more? Just asking. Yes, thank you. All right, so here it is. Same scenario, a lot of numbers here, but all these numbers are exactly what we just went over. So don't overcomplicate that. I drew a circle, okay? Money flows in only two different ways. You all know this, right? So let's just quickly understand the flow of money. 
you all right now are either doing one or the other. One is a straight line. So just envision a straight line. Money goes in one end of that line. Let's call it a pipe. Easier to articulate and visualize with a pipe. So you make money. You take that money and you got a pipe and you, you, you put that money inside the pipe. And that money goes through the pipe. Maybe it makes an, another dollar. And then it comes out the other side of the pipe and it leaves your household paying bills, loans, and everything else, right? That, that way money flows. Everybody understands that. And whatever is left stays in the pipe. The pipe is a 401k, is a savings account, so on and so forth. Now, money also can flow in a complete circle like you see behind me. Still pipe, so just imagine a pipe, but it's in a circle. So we put the money inside the circle, okay? The money goes around the circle and over here comes out of the circle to go into an opportunity or pay off debt. But then whatever those debts and whatever those opportunities makes goes back into the pipe and it goes back around and it ends in the same place. Infinite banking concept is called infinite because it's, it's infinite. It just continually just can, continues to go. A circle is also infinite because in a true circle, if something was to put, be put into a circle, if a ball was in this circle and we spun the ball, the ball can only go inside the circle. It can just keep going round and round. That's money flow, folks. It's no different. So which one do you want? You want your money to go in a straight line pipe where it goes in one end, pops out the other end and disappears, or most of it disappears? Or do you want your money going into a pipe that's a complete circle? The infinite banking concept is that. It's a process that creates a circle. So let's repeat that. That woman took 500000 put it into her own private bank, which was that magic account. Susie Q, it's a magic account, Susie. Dave, it's a, it's a magic account. Some people call it a whole life, but we call it a magic account, okay? Then what we immediately do is we take that money out of that magic account. We don't take our money. Our 500000 stays in the account earning interest and dividends. And we take a loan from the insurance company. or the I'm sorry, correction. We take a loan from the magic account's general account. The magic account has this, account, this general account that they promised us when we died. Yeah, it's the money that the magic account's going to pay when we die. In this case, it's 10 million bucks. So we're gonna take 450,000 out of the magic account as a loan, because they're gonna give us that money that would be paid to us when we die, but we don't wanna die today. So we're just gonna use it today while we live. No problem. They give us that 450 from that magic account, separate account that pays us when we're dead so that our money doesn't have to be interrupted. So our money in the magic account just earns interest and dividends uninterrupted. And that money comes over here and it can be used in various different opportunities like debts. We, we, we do tons of videos and tons of training showing you how we pay debts down and recycle it. Could also be lent out on private money club. Could be lent out to the Fullers. Could be lent out to Chris Rude. Could be lent out to various other people on private money club. Could be invested in stocks. I'd advise against that, but whatever. Could be put into buying real estate. You could buy a car like I often do. You could buy a boat like Stephen has done. You could put it into alternative investments and you could start a business. Whatever. Where would you put 450000 bucks if you had it? On red 23, sure. I wouldn't call that a good opportunity. But you see, all of these opportunities, for the most part, generate some form of interest or money that comes back. If you lend it out at 12%, we got 12% that goes around the bottom part of the circle. We call that recycle recapture. If you pay off a debt, a visa, an Amex, a car loan, the payment you were making to the debt now just comes around the bottom part of the circle. And it all ends up back over here in that magic account as a loan repayment. We're repaying the separate account from the magic account, and that money's just replenishing. But here's the coolest thing. <clears throat> we finally have a calculator for this. It'll be launched in about 43 days, I'm counting down. And that calculator, what it does is it actually shows the impact of being an honest banker and paying yourself back. Because all of you hear one thing, I'm taking a loan and the insurance company's charging me 5%. That's what you all hear. But what if I told you what you hear and what you actually pay are two different things? Is the interest on the loans 5%? Yeah, it's right around there, maybe a little less. But do you actually pay 5% if you follow the infinite banking process? No. Why? Because every time we send the money out to an opportunity and we bring the money back around the bottom and put it back into the policy, what are we effectively doing? Aren't we paying the loan down? Yeah, every payment pays the loan down, just like every payment pays your car loan down, except for you don't get to use the money. 
The finance company does. Every mortgage payment pays your house down a little bit. Okay. Every payment you make on all the debts you have pays something down. So you're just paying the loan down. So because you're paying the loan down, the way the insurance companies calculate the interest is they do it daily, but it's really paid one time a year. So, so over 12 months, if every month we pay the loan down, effectively the interest rate, the 5% interest that is being charged is being charged on a lower balance every month, which means effectively, if we figure out the actual interest rate you pay year after year, it goes down, down, and down. But the money in your account, which never left your account, goes up, up, and up because it's compounding uninterrupted. In the 90-minute video that we do that's at chrisnoggle.com, if you haven't seen it, watch the 90-minute video. We articulate this really well. Steven does a fantastic job showing this. One's going up. Your money's going up because it's compounding. And one's going down, the loan balance. And as that happens, if you remember the numbers I showed you, all the numbers start to go up. Every day, you have more money than you had the day before. That was just a really simple way of understanding it. So now let's hit some of the questions. <clears throat> yeah, I actually had a couple of good ones come in. So Mike was saying, I got burned with a whole life policy with an $80,000 investment and 20,000 per year until early 2000. The portfolio did well. And I was told I no longer need to make deposits. So I stopped. And within eight years, it was all gone. No benefit, no nothing. Afraid to do it again. Okay, Mike, I, I know exactly what happened there. So first off, you had a regular whole life. No question. It's not anything like the one that I just showed you, because those are specially designed and engineered. We put a lot less death benefit on and we shove a lot more money into the paid up additions rider. So that's the first thing. The second thing, what happened is whoever gave you that advice to stop paying, and, and I love how you use that word, no longer need to make deposit. Well, you actually said deposits, but most people would no longer have to make payments to the whole life because that's the way most people look at it. What effectively happened is one of two things. The agent or the company shifted your dividend from accumulating your cash value to now paying your premium deposit. Okay, that's the first thing. So now you don't have dividends growing it. But even that would not deplete your cash value. And, and I'm almost hesitant to say that it doesn't sound like you had a whole life because in a whole life, what you're describing would almost be physically impossible for all your money to end unless your policy lapsed. So the only thing I can think is somehow... And this, this is not normal. So yours is a really weird scenario. Somehow your premium deposits were being paid from your cash value, not just your dividend. And, and, and I don't know how they did this. I don't even know how that's possible because most companies wouldn't allow you to do that. I mean, they would, but if you stopped paying, well, actually, no, I, I got it. I got it. Sorry. I had to think this one through. If you stopped making the premium deposits in your, in your case, the payments, uh, what would happen is if your dividend was not enough to cover your premium deposits, it would draw automatically from the cash value. And over time, that would deplete your cash value and it would stop the growth of the policy. Effectively, you would end up with no money. So if that's what's keeping you from doing what we teach, you're talking about apples and oranges, two totally different things, two totally different plan designs. And it was that, a variable universe. It was a VUL, Chris. I knew it. Notice how I said that? That does not sound like a whole life. You had a yeah, variable just, universal life. Congratulations, cool. Mike. The same thing that happened to you happened to everybody else pretty much that had a VUL. That's why they don't have them anymore. They were, <laughs> yeah, they, well, they do, but like I had one. I had a VUL that I started in 2024. Those policies are toxic. Just like IULs are toxic. I, I have one right here, and I'm going to be doing a whole training on this. This is a pack life IUL illustration that was done by a gentleman, nice gentleman, who said that IULs can be better than whole life for the infinite banking concept. So I said, great. I said, Aaron, make me a, a, an IUL, the best one you possibly can, strip as much of your commission out of it, and give me an IUL that would rival any whole life insurance policy. And he did that. He designed an IUL that would be a high early cash value IUL that strips his, his commission down, which it effectively did but I'm going to do a training showing you what the best of the best of the best did saying this is better than whole life for the infinite banking concept. And I'm not going to do that today, but we're going to get into that. I know all of you are like, give me it. <clears throat> so you had a VUL. It's just like an IUL, except for there's no guaranteed floor. So what happened when you stopped making, so a couple things happened. Now that you, I, we know you didn't have a whole life. You had a VUL. Every year in a VUL, the cost of insurance goes up and up. Same thing in an IUL. 
Every year you get older, your cost goes up. It's just like term insurance, okay? Every year you get older, the cost of insurance goes up. Inside of a whole life, your cost of insurance is exactly the same till the day you die. Never changes. There's no moving parts in a whole life. The cost of insurance is level till the day you die, okay? So in a VUL, it kept going up. So when you stopped making premium deposits, what happened is the policy had to survive based on the growth of the separate account, the mutual funds. But the mutual funds didn't perform. Okay? And because they didn't perform, it didn't make enough to keep itself alive when you stopped making premium deposits. Plus, you were fighting almost an invisible enemy, and that was the cost of insurance going up every year. The policy was deemed to fail. IULs and VULs are designed to put all the risk on you, the client, not the insurance company. Whole Life puts all the risk on the insurance company, not you, the client. It's actually a good question. Kind of how to use a, a, you know, one of our policies for retirement. So uh, in retirement, want to live <laughs> off nest egg in the policy is the only way to do this by invested or lending something outside of the policy so that we can pay it back in full. So we, when we pay back what we pull out, how do we live off the nest egg when we are ready to or want to? It seems like the only way to do that is to pull from principal or not pay back the loan or have an investment pay back the loan. So just want to go through the kind of just some examples of using a policy for retirement. Yeah. So I've got a couple of YouTube videos on that. Um, first off, I mean, from the bare basics, Back when I was an advisor, we, we were taught a strategy called SLURP, kind of you know along the same lines as IBC. It was just a concept. And what that concept was, you put money in a whole life, you let it grow over time. And then when retirement comes, you figure out what you can take out each year. And then you, you take withdrawals from the account, not loans. You take withdrawals, which brings the cash value down. So it's going to diminish your compounding. And then once you get to your cost basis, you flip it to take loans so that you never pay taxes. And then you take loans until the policy exhausts itself. I never liked that model, okay? I, I used to love it, but there's so many places where that can fail. Um, so probably the best way to use a policy is you saw the numbers on that one I did, right? Let's just say on that one, we took 458,000, I think was the number out, and we lent that money out on private money club at whatever, 12 or 15%. And then we took 5% of whatever that money made and we just paid it back to the policy. And we just kept doing that over and over and over again. Or you took maybe, maybe you said, all right, well, the bank would charge 8%. So I'm going to pay 8% back to my policy. That's how I do it. I, I always look at what a bank would charge and I just pay my policy back what a bank would charge. So you could do it that way. You're still doing pretty well because now all your money is still growing uninterrupted. All 458,000 from that first year is compounding. You're making the interest, which is the income for retirement on the loan or on whatever you invest in. Okay. That's your interest. The net would be the, the amount of interest you earn minus whatever you decide to pay back to the policy. And every year you're making new savings, you know, deposits into the plan, which we can design to be whatever you want it to be into retirement. So you could start out putting a bunch in and then during retirement, minimize it. Like literally we could design it down to as low as probably, you know, 15%, uh, you know, so 85% less than what the peak years were. So that makes it a lot like how people fund 401ks is they max them out, you know, and put as much as they can into them. And then when they hit retirement, they stop funding them and they just start using savings accounts for the excess that they don't use. It's the same exact thing. So th there's two different ways to do it. There's a slurp <clears throat> or there's just the way we teach with the infinite banking concept. Both work, but the slurp, the infinite banking one works better. Uh, let's see. If my total net cash value in year one is 34000 and 69000 in year two, can I take a loan for those same values in year one and two respectively? Or is it a Total loan of 69000 in year two. Total loan of 69000 in year two. So if you took 34000 out in the first year, you would subtract the sixty nine from the thirty four, and that's the amount that would be available year two. Because remember, the insurance company, it's not your money that you're taking, but the insurance company is collateralizing the loan from their general account using your cash value. So if you've only got 69487 that's the max amount you can take as a loan. So was that helpful, folks? Now imagine if we went like 10 times deeper than we just did there. What if we went like way deeper than that and we did it for three days? A heavy deep dive the first day where we just dissect different ways to do it. And we did it with the math because that's what we're going to do this time. We're going to literally show the math and the impact of how all this works. But instead of just conceptual with these charts, I'm actually just going to, I'm going to show it mathematically and that's how we're going to do it. So if any of you are interested in joining us for the three-day Money School Essentials training, We've got a really cool offer for you. Steven, you want to talk about it? Yeah, so I'll post the link in the box and then we have a discount code for everybody. So if you guys want to get into this, it's November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. 
And uh, with the discount code, it's 33% off. You know, I think a lot of you guys, I mean, I see a lot of familiar names on here. Um, and I see a lot of people that were on last night uh, that when we did this. And so I know a lot of you guys are already registered. But if you haven't registered yet, I did get a couple uh, messages about it. I just posted the link and the, the discount code so we can get you guys in. And um, it's just going to be an awesome three days. I mean, the I don't even know who the, the, the bonus person is you were just talking about, Chris. Like, you know, but... I just spoke I, to him today and I didn't think he was going to be able to do it. And he agreed to do it because he was really excited about showing. It. Yeah. I mean, so the people we have come in, the guests, the speakers, the experts, whatever you want to call them. I mean, they're really, really, really good. I actually had somebody else myself last night I was talking to that I invited to come on Sunday during the, um, the special panel opportunities part. So we're just going to continue loading it up through next weekend. I mean, we're going to be in Vegas this weekend with um, a lot of our a higher level students that are experienced mastermind. And we have a lot of uh, really cool different relationships out there. So we'll probably end up inviting a couple more people by the end of this weekend for the three day, but that's literally all we do is bring people into this event to talk with you and present opportunities. And just like you said, Chris, just really get deep down into all this stuff that we're doing. So if you haven't got a ticket yet, go ahead and get it. The full thing's recorded. Um, so you can go back, watch it later on. You can, um, you know, if you miss any of it, anything like that, you know, you get all the recordings, they're time stamped. The links are all right there. We'll schedule a call with you afterwards with our blueprint team and go through the opportunities, figure it out for you. So you get a lot of value for 197 bucks. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, let's ticket. make it even more fun because, I mean, buying a ticket's only half the battle, as G.I. Joe would say. So why don't I give everybody that that registers today, I'll give you these limited this limited edition shirt. Winners get to do what they want is the back, and that's the front. So it's a hoodie. It's a high-quality hoodie. Winners get to do what they want, and that's the front. So does anyone know where this is from? And if you're thinking Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell, you're right, because this is the Will Ferrell limited edition lineup, you know, like here. Don't act like you're not impressed. I mean, come on, you know where that came from. This one, winners get to do what they want. <clears throat> if you ain't first, you're last. I mean, you guys can go on and buy these sweatshirts, but they're like 68 bucks. Or you could just buy a ticket to the three-day money school essentials training, and you can get one of these. Just tell us what your size is when you register. In the, and there's like a little memo part when you register. Just tell us your size. And we'll give you one of these limited edition Will Ferrell or Talladega Nights, or I think there's a couple from Step Brothers, you know, whatever one you want, you can get one. Cool. And with, with that being said, folks, thank you. I'm happy my voice sort of made it through to the end. Sorry, it was a little less energetic, or I was a little less energetic, but I think we pulled through and I thought uh, hopefully some of you will take action on some of this. Save yourself from a massive financial cliff that a lot of people are going to go over because they're not ready for it and they're not prepared because they're looking right in front of their car instead of looking through the turn like indie racers do with that thanks everybody for joining us we will see you this afternoon at 4 30 for the ask me anything happy hour all right so i hope you guys enjoyed that episode we're putting up tons of them but i think if you like this one you'll probably like that video as well not only that I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.